Good morning. Now may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we continue our series of sermons entitled Bless. In our reading today, we have possibly the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God loved the world so much. He didn't want it to perish. He wanted to bless it. But so often we stop there. But we need to read on. In the next verse, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So many people see God as an angry judge, with a big stick, just waiting to condemn and punish us. But going back to the first book of the Bible, to the call of Abraham, we read, as we read last week, the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. God wants to bless Abraham and his descendants. But he was doing it for a purpose. He told him, you will be a blessing and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The promise to Abraham was that he and his descendants would be or bring God's blessing to all peoples. But as so often, they just saw the blessing for themselves and forgot a bit about bringing or being a blessing to others. So to come back to today's reading, Jesus also, the same, came to be a blessing. God doesn't want us to be lost. He did not come to judge and condemn us. He sent Jesus to save us. And look now how that passage continues. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's only one and only Son. He isn't the angry judge, but a loving God who has gone to great lengths to save us. Those that are condemned are those that have refused to accept his free offer of eternal life. And so it continues. This is the verdict. The light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Unfortunately, people reject him as they want to cling to their sinful and selfish ways. They don't want to change. If we are followers of Jesus, then we too, like Abraham was called to be, and like Jesus was, We need to be a blessing. Too many churches have an ark mentality where they are saved in a sea from the big, bad, evil world outside. We judge and condemn those outside and then batten down the hatches of our own little world, leaving those outside to perish. As Jeanette told us last week, we are not saved from but saved for a purpose, for a mission. I'm reminded of the verse, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. If we try to keep our life, we will lose it. We cannot shut out an evil world outside. 
We're called to bring light and love of Christ to that hurting world. We are to give ourselves just as Jesus did. We are to give ourselves for his gospel and then we will gain life. So, what are we to do? Well, what did Jesus do? We need to model ourselves on Jesus. Jesus, before he began his public ministry, he spent 40 days fasting and praying in the wilderness, doing battle with the evil one and being tempted to perform his ministry in other ways. And on other occasions, when he had important decisions to make, he spent time in prayer. Luke records, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. So before he chose the 12, he spent the whole night in prayer. If Jesus needed to spend all night seeking his Father's will, how much more do we need to? When we were considering the bus stop cafe back in November, we began to meet to pray on Zoom on a Thursday evening. We didn't open till March, but we met regularly every week to seek God's will for the project. Whenever we have an important decision or a new venture, we need to seek God, and that means spending time with him. And it's much easier if we already know God's presence, if we have already spent time developing a relationship with him. As Jesus' ministry continued, he often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. As Luke records, he says, Yet the news about him spread all the more, so that crowds of people came to hear him and to be healed of their sickness. But Jesus often withdrew to a lonely place and prayed. And we need to continue to pray, not only for the bus stop cafe, but for all our ministries that take place in Cogs. We need to look to him and hold them up in prayer and look to him for the way forward. As we read through the Gospels, we frequently find Jesus making time to spend alone with God. We read at the beginning of John's Gospel that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. Jesus was God. It goes on in a few verses after that. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So that word became flesh and became a human being. As Hebrews reminds us, it reads, for this reason he, that's Jesus, had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. Jesus was fully human as well as fully God. He took the limitations of a human being and as such, he had to spend time building his relationship with his Father, time in prayer, seeking his Father's will and maintaining that relationship just like we have to. And if Jesus needed to spend time, how much more do we do? We need to spend time developing that relationship with God. It's like any relationship. It takes time, quality time, to get to know one another. And like any human relationship, if you don't spend time with one another, you drift apart. If you have good friends or a partner that you've spent known for many years, 
you will know what they like and what they're liable to think about a situation, what they would want. And it's like that with our relationship with God. We need to pray regularly and develop patterns and habits of prayer. Jesus taught his disciples to pray and be persistent in prayer. And as we saw last week, he also prayed for his disciples and for those who would believe in him through their message. Can I recommend Pete Gregg's book, How to Pray? It's well worth it, and it's the book the prayer course is built around. If you want to learn more about prayer, can I recommend read that book? But don't wait to read that book. Just spend time. Start spending time with God and in God's presence. Paul, in his letters, frequently begins by giving thanks and praying for the churches that he's writing to. Typical example is what the, when he writes to the Ephesians. He writes... I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he called you the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his inca- incomparably great power for us who believe. Let's pause a moment and watch a video. It's only two minutes. The best thing anyone can ever do is to become a disciple of Jesus Christ because when they do so, they discover they're loved by God and that they have an eternal future and all their sins and are forgiven. So as we come towards thy kingdom come between Ascension and Pentecost this year, pick five people that you really care about. Pray about all of their lives, everything that matters to them, but pray above all that the Holy Spirit opens their eyes to who Jesus is because that is the only way they're going to hear the voice of Jesus saying, come and follow me. Has a family member or friend ever actually prayed for you? That has definitely happened before. My mum is a hardcore Christian. If they have, I don't think I know. Yes, many times. I hope so. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. So, yeah, I don't know. Too. They might have done. Not to my knowledge, but that'd be really nice. How did it make you feel? I actually really like it. I think it's really wholesome, even if I'm not like very religious myself. It's just really nice for someone to like uh, offer their time and like their thinking space. It makes me feel seen. It makes me feel like wanted and blessed. It's always a nice thing, know. even if it's not for for a cause or yeah. a reason. When I lived in France, I went blind. <laughs> this is so, this is so weird. But I went, I went completely blind and I remember my, my family were like texting me like, we're praying for you, like all the time. Exactly. And I wasn't, and now I'm not blind anymore, so I guess maybe it works. Yeah. Back to bless. We can do more than just pray for ourselves and our own needs. It's the way all of us can bless our friends and family. And Paul's prayer for the Ephesians is a good model when praying for them. He begins by giving thanks for them. He prays that God would spend, send his spirit of wisdom and revelation so that they might know him better, that they might know the hope which, to which he calls us, and that they would know the riches and the power given to those who believe. And of course, since you know your friends, you can pray for any needs that you know that they have. And as Justin said, that the gift of knowing Christ is such a wonderful one, 
I would encourage you not to limit yourselves to praying for five people for just the few days between Ascension and Pentecost, but to make it a permanent part of your daily time with God. As we heard last week, we are all called to mission, and this is just one missional habit that we can adopt, a gift that we can give to our friends and to our family. So let's pray together. And I'm going to finish again using Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. I give thanks for my family at Cogs, remembering you all in my prayers. I ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Amen.